Hi guys. In my last video, I talked about self-denial, self-acceptance, healing, um, the cross, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. Um, one part that I, I, I thought I, I went over very quickly, but I want to talk a little more. And that was about healing, meditation, prayer, also certain sort of visualizations that I was talking about. Um, one of them was, you know, the carpenter shop that I talked about. And um, I think that the, the quote that I talked about from John of the Cross in that video, I think it is helpful again. Let me read it. Because um, it makes, um, it makes a lot of sense, and then I'll, ex if you look at it through the context of healing the cross and sort of going beyond um, attachments. Let me, let me read again what he said. He, he wrote, he said, um, if he wrote, <laughs> if individuals resolutely submit to the carrying of the cross, if they decidedly want to find and endure trial in all things for God, they will discover in all of them great relief and sweetness, great relief. Um, that was something I always looked for in the gay life. It's sort of weird to say, relief, peace. Never found it, but that's what I was always going after. Uh, let me look, let, let me explain it this way. Um, especially in the gay sex act, we find peace. We find this momentary harmony in our life. Let's say in another man's arms. Um, you know, why does this happen? Well, this goes back to why we go gay or become gay or discover gay or realize gay or come out, whatever you want to talk about it. Usually this happens after a childhood that is filled with, you know, anxiety, loss, confusion, um, embarrassment, um, being bullied, being teased, feeling alienated, um, not feeling like you fit in. So when, usually later, um, you have this realization after all of that trial that gay is the missing piece of the puzzle that you couldn't figure out as a kid because you were so overwhelmed by sadness and emotion. And then usually um, as you get older, gay becomes that sort of answer to the question, like, what was wrong with me? And then, gay. And then you say, well, there it is, I'm gay. That's why I was, you know, so conflicted before. Now that I'm gay, that can, that, you know, that battle within the self stops, supposedly. Now, it's interesting because there's so much promiscuity in the gay male world, and then the, the harmony and the unity and sort of the, the peace um, that was promised in gay is lacking. It's, it's not found. So sex becomes the root in which, you know, you try to work that out or find that or seek that. That's why gay sex becomes very imaginative. You have bizarre subgroups and subcultures and genre within gay that you're, I don't care what anybody says, you're never going to find in the straight world. Um, it becomes very, a lot of times very sadistic, sadistic and perverse to the extreme um, in the all-male culture of you know, gay, um, male homosexuality. Um, 
there, there isn't the safeguard that women play in um, the heterosexual world. And um, things get out of control very quickly and very hardcore. And, you know, I discovered this very, very intimately and very, very, on a very personal level that everything that I looked for, the peace that I looked for, the relief that St. John of the Cross talks about, was just always, it seemed always beyond me. Like it was the next experience, the next sex act, the next guy would be the one that would fulfill me. But the sad and tragic part is, and, um, you know, I went around this circle for years, was afterwards, let's say after the sex act, I felt more empty than I did before, before I started doing whatever I was going to do. And then that sets up that feeling of desperation. That sets up the quest for the next sex act. I could remember, you know, doing something very hardcore, let's say, you know, before noon or around noon. And by the afternoon or evening, I was wanting to do something else. Um, in that way, it's almost like a drug addiction that you're always seeking that next high. And, but why are you seeking that? Because there is something fundamentally hurt and wounded within you, um, that is not part of you. It's not, you weren't born with this. You weren't born with this scar, with this gaping wound. The thing is that healing is possible. Um, I would have to do a whole series of videos on that. Um, but let me give an example again with the carpenter shop and let me get into it more in depth. Um, here, we ha here I have St. Joseph and the Child Jesus right behind me in this picture. Um, in your house, in your room, in your apartment, whatever, um, set up a place of prayer that's quiet, that's separate, that is, um, lends itself to some peace, you know, not with the computer or the TV is, or where there's a lot of distractions. Um, and this can be your space, especially the this, this space of healing. Um, and again, I want to go back to that carpenter shop, because to me, that was very much a male, masculine, manly space. Um, very intimidating. Um, I don't know, maybe a modern equivalent would be like the auto garage or something where, you know, you have these men that are very, you know, masculine and working and to some gay men that would be an intimidating place. Um, also an attractive one. That's why in a lot of like gay fantasy and gay porn, there's this uh, you know, very weird sort of fetishizing of sort of like blue-collar, heterosexual, um, where these plots in gay porn always have to do with the mechanic or the construction work. I mean, you see this in the village people in the 70s, the construction worker, the fireman, the policeman. You know, there's this fetishizing of it in the uniform. Um, but that's, you know, that's, I'm getting off track here. So... The carpenter shop was very scary to me because I just felt it was somewhere where I didn't belong as sort of a faulted boy or, or sort of a, a malformed man. 
And it was gay that was really keeping me from there. So a lot of times in meditation and in prayer, I could see myself looking into that space where Christ and his foster father, St. Joseph, worked, you know, in, in these very manly sort of arts of, of, you know, woodworking or, you know, whatever, furniture making. And, um, <clears throat> you know, as slowly as I, you know, you watch that, but, you know, as an aside, this goes along with healthy relationships in, you know, your non-meditation or prayer world, where you have very healthy meditation, healthy relationships, especially with heterosexual men, especially family men, and, you know, you see true masculinity and manliness, and you come to appreciate that and its worth beyond sort of this, you know, hyper sexualization that happens in the gay world with everything that's that's masculine. Um, and, um, you know, slowly I just sort of dropped gay and just sort of left it at the door um, as something I was carrying around. And then you could walk through that threshold and you can, you know, enter into that relationship between Christ, his foster father, and it's, it's a very healing realization of that sort of healthy, good relationship between father and son. And it, it you know, it's, it's a very simple and sort of basic way to at least begin the healing process. Now there's a lot more to it, because it involves a lot of times going back to your own childhood and finding out, you know, why things became so traumatic for you that you were unable to relate to men in a way that is not sexual. The, you know, gay became attractive because, you know, the relationship you had with the man you know, needed to take on a sexual aspect as a way to fulfill yourself. So, you know, I encourage you all to, to pray in this way, especially to ask St. Joseph um, for his prayers and for guidance to um, heal from this, this gay wound that... Um, it's very possible to move beyond and to finally, as St. John of the Cross um, wrote, to have relief and finally have peace in your life. God bless you and I love you all.